Bottle. Come preach, brother. Thank you, preacher. Wow. Well, what a blessing. Amen. I praise the Lord for what the Lord is doing, not only for what he has done, but for what he is doing right here. And you know, I was just uh, sitting there thinking as the pastor was sharing that news with you, only eternity will reveal the true worth of what you're doing. Now, you'll see a lot of the effect down here, absolutely. There's just something about a faith promised missions giving church that separates it apart from all other churches of our day. Amen. It's just there's a different spirit if there's a spirit of giving in the church. And I'm so thrilled for what you're going to be blessed to see the Lord do right here. But when we get home, and we will get there one day. And when we were blessed to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I assure you, you won't be sorry then that you gave regularly, faithfully, systematically, as the Word of God teaches, over and above your regular tithes and offerings so that others could hear the gospel. I'm absolutely thrilled, thrilled at what the Lord is doing right here. Cassie and I were talking about it on the way over here. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, if we had to uh, pick the top five missions conferences that we've ever been in, this missions conference would be one of them. The Lord has certainly gifted your pastor with a lot of wisdom, knowledge about how to have a meeting like this and stir people for the cause of world evangelism. And if there's ever been a day, God's men ought to know how to do that. It's in this day and hour in which we're living. I not only want to thank the pastor for his burden and for his vision, but I want to thank you precious people for being willing to follow your pastor and catch at least a portion of his vision. And I assure you, God will bless you as you follow the faith of your man of God. Cassie and I had a wonderful time at the uh, preacher's house today, and I can attest everything he said about that lemon meringue pie, it's true. It really is true. And uh, not only the lemon rank pie, everything else I enjoyed putting into the gospel ministry today. It was wonderful. It was great. And uh, they've been so kind to us in so many different ways. Your preacher certainly meets the qualification of being given to hospitality. And I'm so thankful for that. I want to say thank you to the staff, all of the staff, all you guys. My, what a blessing you have been. Even Mario, what a blessing he has been. I told Cassie, I said, I, I'm ruined for life now. From now till Jesus comes, this is Brother Mario. I, and if you were here last night, you know exactly what I'm talking about. His wife was playing the uh, instrumental over here, and I leaned over to Cassie. I said, is that Mrs. Mario? She said, yes, honey, yes, honey. I'll never remember her name either. It's from now till Jesus comes, she's Mrs. Mario. But the staff, the staff, Miss Emily, the office staff, all of the, the pastoral staff, the staff of the school, I'll tell you, you're a cut above. And boy, that's so commendable. Thank you, thank you for going the extra mile to give Jesus your best. He gave his best for us. Why should we give him any less? Amen. So thank you, thank you. Please pray for our safety as we travel. We're going to try to get four or five hours under our belts tonight and wake up tomorrow <clears throat> and, Lord willing, go the rest of the way. We're trying to navigate around that snow, you know, they say is coming in. And uh, so please pray for us as we're on the road. Just a few things uh, I want to mention that we have on our table, and then we'll get right into the preaching of the Word of God. First of all, I have something I want to put in the hands of at least every family. I think I got enough for everyone that would like to have one. But this is Macedonia's latest magazine we call Focus on the Field. This will allow you to become somewhat more acquainted of what we do for our now 130 missionary families literally around the world. A lot of questions about what do you do, Brother Caudill? What does Macedonia do for the missionaries and the churches that you help service every month? A lot of those questions can be answered by just picking up a focus on the field. They are absolutely free of charge. I think, again, we have as many as we need tonight, so please make sure to pick one up on the way out this evening. And then I have some things I wish I could give you. They don't give them to me, so I can't pass along the savings to you, but I do have have some CDs with us this week and so far for the last four years God has really used the CD sales to help us with our travel 
tremendous expense in traveling, gas, upkeep on the van, things like that. And so the Lord has worked through the CD sales to help with that. So I have, uh, I think, about six different CDs. I'll tell you just about four. The latest CD is called Someone Somewhere Needs to Hear. A while back, we did a promotional video at Macedonia that we're showing in Bible colleges now. And that song, Someone Somewhere Needs to Hear, is a song God gave me that I wrote for the video. I recorded it along with some other new songs, some older songs as well. It's available tonight as well. The song by faith that I just finished singing, uh, that's the title song on this, the by faith CD. Also the song I sung Wednesday night, uh, For All the World is on here as well. Some more original songs, some old songs of the faith uh, that I think you'll... Uh, uh, no, when you hear them, there is a fountain, he hideth my soul, things like that. And then uh, every now and then somebody will come by the table and they'll look at this CD. It's called Acapella Blessings. And they'll ask the question, Preacher, what's up with the uh, Acapella Blessings? What is that? And I said, well, a few years ago, the Lord burdened my heart. I wanted to go into the recording studio and just see if I could do this. Take a song like um, uh, Tell It to Jesus. Tell it to, are you weary, are you heavy hearted? Record the lead and then go back and sing the tenor. Are you weary, are you heavy hearted? And then go back after you had the lead and the tenor and try to sing the baritone. And then after you had the tenor, the lead and the baritone, go back and try to sing the bass. And then sort of stack them on top of each other just to see what you can do. You can't practice with yourself if you're singing all the parts. So it's just really, you don't know how it's going to turn out. Well, this is how it turned out. And I learned a lot doing this CD. And the greatest thing I learned, never do that again. <laughs> Took too long, cost too much. You know, at first I started thinking, well, there's no music on this CD. I'll knock this out in two days. Two months later, I'm still working on it. Uh, I could only do about uh, two songs at the most a day, and then I'd have to leave, go back, because you'd be so tired. But some songs has as many as six and seven vocals. I had a lot of fun doing it. It's called Acapella Blessings, 12 songs on that CD that I trust if you pick up, it'll be a blessing. I love the old hymns of the faith. I love new songs, songs like God Gives Your Preacher. By the way, that song, the choir sung today, I've already talked to the preacher. If the Lord will allow me and he will allow me, I'd love to record that song one day. What a great song. Choir, you did a great job singing it. I love the new songs, but I want to tell you, there's just something about songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Uh, there's just something about It Is Well With My Soul. There's just something about I'll meet you in the morning. I'm getting Jesus measles just thinking about it. Just something about those old songs. And I have two hymn CDs. This is called Hymns I Love. But I have another hymns CD uh, that's uh, all the music on it is acoustic music. There's everything from a cello to a banjo uh, to whatever other kind of, of uh, uh, you know, wooden instruments. And I've always wanted to do one of those. I have those available here with me tonight as well. Cassie will be at the table after the service. So will I. I want to shake your hand. Thank you so very much for having us. Please, please, more than anything else, would you please pick up a prayer card and pray for us? Uh, now, I, I want to implore you to pray for us. Uh, we are probably on the road now between 50 and 60,000 miles a year, not including air miles. And I don't know if you have spent much time on the road, but the people on the road, they have lost their minds. They have lost their minds. I mean, I was riding down the road just the other day, and there was a lady driving down the road. She was, had one hand on the steering wheel. She was texting. She was eating lunch. She was putting on makeup all at the same time. And I finally turned to Cassie and I said, you put all that stuff down and drive this vehicle, amen. <laughs> I'm trying to get her straightened out about things like that. But people on the road have just lost their mind. So please, please, if you could pray for us, we certainly would appreciate that. Well, turn in your Bible, if you would please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And with the help of the Lord, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1 of the chapter and be reading through verse number 9. I realize I've said it two or three times during the meeting, but I want to thank Brother Tom and Miss Louise again 
for opening their home to us. And Cassie and I have just, we have made some new friends with the Corona Wetters this week, and we have enjoyed, I told Miss Louise earlier tonight, we have felt as if we were home away from home. And we so appreciate the kindness. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you so very much for everything. The preacher gave me liberty tonight. He said, preacher, you preach whatever God lays on your heart. So having pastored 22 years myself, when a preacher gives me liberty to do that, I always want to preach what I would want a preacher to preach if I was the pastor. And so I asked the Lord, Lord, would you give me permission just to stir Calvary Baptist Church tonight to keep on doing what they're doing for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? And it doesn't always happen this way, but God gave me liberty to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. If you found your place, would you stand tonight? 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we will be using our Bibles tonight, and therefore I trust you'll leave them handy during the message this evening. Let's bow our heads, shall we, for a moment of prayer. Father, you know my heart tonight. I want to finish this meeting well. I want to be a blessing to Pastor Shiflet. My, what a blessing he has been to me and Miss Cassie this week. Then, Lord, I want to do my best for these precious people, these people that we have absolutely fallen in love with. Lord, we're so grateful to be a part already of their missions family. We're so very grateful to uh, be able to labor with them to reach the world with the gospel. And Father, tonight, would you use me just to encourage them to keep on keeping on for your honor and for your glory. Help me tonight, I pray you would. I'm nothing without thee. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. It is while reading the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, we discover that God used Paul to establish the local Bible-believing church at Corinth. However, having departed the city for Ephesus after a relatively short time there, Paul began to learn of serious issues that had arisen within the church, which in turn was distracting the Corinthians from keeping the main thing the main thing. Therefore, Paul is writing the letter before us tonight in order to remind the Corinthians exactly what God intended for the main thing to be. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm getting ready to say. Are you listening, church? Say amen. God never intended for the local church to major on discord, distraction, or drama. I think I'll back up and say that again. God never intended for the local church to major on discord, distraction, or drama. 
Those things aren't the main thing. The main thing is the worship as well as the work of God. The main thing is not only the edification and the enlisting of the saints, but the main thing is the evangelization of the sinner for the glory of God. In fact, I submit to you tonight, Paul makes that point abundantly clear as early as the first few verses of the chapter that he has directed our hearts to tonight. Therefore, before we zero in on a portion of this uh, text that God has directed our hearts to tonight, let's consider the first few verses by way of introduction to the message, shall we? First of all, when you look into 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 1, here we witness Paul writing about the greeters. We not only read and study about the apostle, but we also read and study about his associate as well as we read about a man by the name of Sophanes. So in verse number one, we read and study about the greeters. Now look at verse number two. In verse number two, we read and study about the great head as the word of God teaches us in the text that Paul is writing this letter to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now let's review. Verse number one, we see the greeters. Verse number two, we see the great head. In verse number three, we see the greeting. As Paul writes, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from from the Lord Jesus Christ. The greeting, verse number three. But then beginning with verse number four and continuing through verse number seven, here we see what the Holy Spirit of God inspired Paul to write about the gifts. Look at verse number four. Paul writes, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, according to the Bible before us, in verses four through seven, Paul is writing about the gifts. He is specifically in the text writing about the gifts of utterance and knowledge that God had blessed the church at Corinth with. In fact, when you study your Bible in depth, particularly about what God has to say about the church of Corinth, you'll discover that God had gifted them in several ways. However, as a result of carnality that had crept into the church, there was a danger of misusing those gifts or taking those gifts for granted. That brings us to the immediate occasion of Paul pinning this letter. Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians to admonish and in fact implore them not to make the mistake of misusing those gifts. In fact, the reason for Paul's writing can actually be detected in verses six and seven where the Bible says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe when you study your Bible, you'll discover these carnal Corinthians were coming behind. They were bringing up the rear, if you please, when it came to the work of God as a result of carnal issues that had crept into the church. You know what their problem was? Let me tell you what their problem was. Their problem was they had been distracted from keeping the main thing the main thing. They had been distracted from soul winning. They had been distracted from missions outreach. They had been distracted from bus ministry. They had been distracted from their daily prayer time and daily Bible reading time. They had been distracted from keeping the main thing the main thing. And brother, every time I read these verses of Scripture, particularly as I zero in on verses 6 and 7, I am reminded of the sad plight of many churches across our great nation this very evening. Hear me. 
God has blessed many churches with various gifts. Various gifts in order for them to be effective for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, more times than not, as a result of carnal issues that often creep into the church, they too make the same mistake these Corinthians are making in the text in that they often fail to keep the main thing the main thing. It sort of reminds me of a story I heard on one occasion of two pastors. They had met one day for lunch and the restaurant where they were meeting had somewhat of a western decor, a western motif, and as they were enjoying their lunch, they happened to look on the wall where they were, where they were eating and they noticed in the restaurant a picture of a locomotive or a train. One preacher looked at the engine of that train and he made a statement to the pastor that sat across the table from him and he said, you know, I know I have my share of problems, as do you, but can I tell you, I've got some folks in my church just like that engine and they're willing to help me pull the load of ministry. The other pastor, having heard that statement from his friend, looked beyond the engine of that locomotive hanging on the wall and he saw the cars in the train. He said, well, preacher, can I give a word of testimony as well? If you've got some folks in your church like that engine that's willing to help you pull the load, I can testify to the fact God has sent me some precious people just like the cars of that train and they're willing to help me shoulder the load or carry the load. They were feeling encouraged at least for a while until both of them looked beyond the engine and they looked beyond the cars and they saw the final car. Do you know what the final car in a train is called? Some of you young folks might not know, but ask your mom and dad about it after the service. It's called the caboose. The caboose is content to bring up the rear. The caboose is content to be pulled along everywhere it goes. If it's going to make it somewhere, it will be as a result of that engine and the cars doing their share of the load and then some because the caboose is content to bring up the rear or to come behind. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the problem with the church at Corinth. That's why Paul is writing according to verse 7, so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So with that truth in mind tonight, this final night of Missions Conference 18, I felt impressed to the Lord with the liberty of the Lord and your pastor to preach on this thought. There's no excuse for being a caboose. God sent me here to tell you this final night of your missions conference, there's no excuse for coming behind when it comes to the work of God, when it comes to reaching your community for Christ, when it comes to giving, when it comes to singing, when it comes to preaching, when it comes to ministry, when it comes to reaching your fullest potential collectively or personally for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no excuse for being a caboose. I want you to know tonight whether it is the enlistment of the saints or the evangelization of the sinner, each and every one of us ought to be willing to come alongside Pastor Shiflin and say, Preacher, I want to be like that engine the preacher was talking about. I want to help you pull the load around here. Uh, maybe somebody else needs to come up to the man of God tonight and say, Preacher, I may not be able to sing in the choir. I may not be able to uh, preach a message like you do or... Uh, teach a Sunday school class but preacher I just want you to know I want to be like the cars in that old train you're not going to have to bear the load of this ministry on your own I'm going to be there for you preacher I want to help you I want to stand by you I want to be like those cars and help you carry the load preacher when it comes to going when it comes to giving when it comes to getting things done for God every one of us ought to do our fair share because there's no excuse for being 
Huckaboos. In fact, here in the text tonight, Paul not only warns these carnal Corinthians of the danger of coming behind, but he also goes as far as to inform them of a few reasons why there was no excuse for being a caboose. So I just want to share with you tonight what Paul was sharing with these carnal Corinthians then. First of all, I want you to know, number one, there's no excuse for being a caboose because of the coming of of the Lord. We've talked about it all day long. We've sung about the coming of the Lord all day long. The preacher's done a little bootleg preaching all day long and he's preached on the coming of the Lord. My, isn't that amazing how God puts a service together like that. Well, the same God that inspired and instructed your preacher to talk today about the coming of the Lord spoke to my heart and he sent me here to tell you this. There's no excuse for bringing up the rear when it comes to the service of the Lord because Jesus Jesus is coming. Can I prove it to you? Look at verses 7 and 8 again. Verses 7 and 8 of our text. Paul writes, so that you come behind in no gift, watch your Bible now, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me tonight, church. There is a reason we should be serving the great God of glory to the fullest extent. There is a reason why we ought to be giving God our best, following the faith of our pastor, doing what God has commanded us to do, especially in the matter of world evangelism, because Jesus is coming. What we do for the Lord, we must do quickly. The king's business requires haste. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I'm going to say it until you say amen. Jesus is coming. The main thing is reaching the world with the gospel because Jesus is coming. The main thing is being faithful to the house of God, faithful to give, faithful to go, faithful to get involved because Jesus is coming. Coming, the main thing is the edification of the saints, the evangelization of the sinner, because Jesus is coming. I don't know if you're hearing me tonight, but Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. I hadn't got much exercise this week, so I think I'll get it in tonight. Jesus is coming again, amen. There's no excuse for being a caboose. Let me, let me tell you something tonight. I'm feeling great liberty. I'm going to meddle a little bit right here. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not on board with this missions thing. Maybe you're here tonight and you got some sort of bitter spirit rising up in your heart tonight. I want to tell you something. If Jesus comes back tonight, and by the way, he could come back tonight. He could come back tonight. When you leave, if you're saved, you're going to leave at the rapture of the church. The Word of God teaches us, if the dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I want you to know there's going to be a grand reunion in the clouds, but shortly after that, we're going to the judgment seat. And there at the judgment seat, every single one of us will stand not collectively, but personally, individually, to give an account of how faithful we have been to carry out God's commands in his Bible here on this earth. That's why I say, and I preach often, especially when I was a pastor, I tried to remind the folks that I pastored often, not everybody, not everybody, are you listening? Say amen. Not everybody, I don't care what you've been told, not everybody is going to leave with a shout at the rapture. There'll be some folks that'll leave with a shiver because they'll be ashamed. They'll be ashamed at the coming of the Lord. Exactly right. That's why I'm here to tell you tonight, listen, I'd get rid of that bitter spirit if I was you. 
because you're not going to be able to stand at the judgment seat and see the thrice holy God of glory. You're not going to be able to view the Savior and see the open wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side. And you're not going to say, well, I tell you, I would have given the missions. I would have got on board with Pastor Shiflet and the greater majority of Calvary Baptist Church of Dundalk, Maryland. But Lord, I'm just here to tell you, I just don't appreciate how the pastor, no, there is no excuse. There'll be no excuse at the coming of the Lord. There is no excuse for bringing up the rear. There's no excuse for a bitter attitude. There's no excuse for an unforgiving spirit. There's no excuse for being a caboose. Amen. Now there's two things about the coming of the Lord you need to know tonight. First of all, it's imminent. Do you know what that means? That means, oh boy, before we see the sunrise of another morning, Jesus could come. Before I lay my head, you know, I don't know where I'll lay my head on my pillow tonight. I don't have a clue, but it certainly may not matter because before that old minivan ever gets to its final destination, Jesus could step out on a cloud of glory and Jesus could call us home. And when he calls us home, I'm getting ready to go where he is so that where he is, I'll be forever. His coming is imminent. That means it could happen at any moment. It could happen at any second. It could, you might not even get the second bite of your uh, Big Mac down your throat tonight before Jesus comes. Jesus is coming. His coming is imminent. His coming will be immediate. It will take place in a moment. Not in the blinking of an eye. It's going to be faster than that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. By the way, can I just say that's the greatest diet plan that I know. A lot of folks come by my table and I've got a book in December of 2012. I weighed about 280 pounds. I was a big feller, especially to be as short as I am. I was a pretty big dude. And boy, God put it in my heart to start losing weight. And I prayed and asked the Lord to help me. And the Lord helped me to drop 100 pounds. But it didn't take place immediate. It wasn't imminent. But can I tell you, for all of us that are a few pounds overweight, if Jesus comes back just like that, you'll drop it all at one time. <laughs> Best diet plan I know is the rapture plan. Amen. When we see him, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It will take place immediately. It will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 318 times in the New Testament of the Bible alone, Jesus said, I will come again. And the same Bible that teaches us that Jesus said, I will come again, is the same Bible that teaches us in Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2 that God cannot lie. Do you know what that means? It means if the Bible says Jesus is coming, you mark her down, Jesus is coming. There's no excuse for you bringing up the rear. Oh, but preacher, you just don't know. I, I just have so many physical, there's something you can do for the cause of Christ. And preacher, you just don't know. I have to work so much overtime. I guarantee you, you see Pastor Shiflet after the service, he'll give you something to pray about that'll keep you busy till Jesus comes. I'm simply here saying to you tonight, there's no excuse for bringing up the rear when it comes to the service of the Lord. If Jesus comes tonight, there'll be no excuse because there is no excuse for being a caboose. The coming of the Lord. Not only the coming of the Lord, but there's no excuse for being a caboose because of the consistency of the Lord. Can I prove it to you? Look at verse 9. In verse number 9, God inspired the Apostle Paul to pen three words 
with these carnal Corinthians that were inspired of God to motivate them to give their best to Jesus and to never come behind in the work of God. You can see those three words in verse number nine. Here they are. God is faithful. Can I be honest with you tonight? Those three words are words that keep me fired up for God. God, God, God is faithful. Those three words cause me to want to give God the first fruits of my life instead of the leftovers of my life. The very best that I have to give God. God is faithful. Can I tell you tonight, there's no excuse for bringing up the rear when it comes to the service of the Lord because of the consistency of God. God is faithful. God is faithful. Paul wrote on another occasion, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Hear me tonight. You don't have to come behind because of the consistency of the Lord. God is faithful. You can do your best for the Lord Jesus Christ because God is faithful. You can be faithful in your going, in your giving, in getting things done for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ because God is faithful. I tell you tonight, I'm just going to preach real plain right here. Some of us need to disperse with the excuse, well, I would serve the Lord, but somebody said something about me that I didn't appreciate. Man won't always be faithful, but God is faithful. I've run into people throughout the course, especially over the course of the last four years of doing what I'm doing, and they would say something like this, ah, I would support missions, but I got involved with a missionary family one time, and they messed up and messed up royally on the field, and they came home, and all that money was wasted, and I just want anything to do. Missionaries won't always be faithful. You need to get your eyes off of the missionary and put your eyes on the master. Oh, preacher, I would serve God. God and I would live for God. I would get involved in the ministry of Calvary Baptist Church, but I had a preacher way back yonder when I was a little boy or a little girl, and boy, they broke my heart. Well, sure they will. You know why? Because they're made up of the same stuff you're made out of. But can I tell you tonight, God has never let you down. God has never let you down. God has never fallen short of glory. Can I tell you why there's no excuse for being a caboose? Not only only because of the calling of the Lord, but because of the consistency of the Lord. God is faithful. God is faithful. You can give. You can go. You can get along, church, because God is faithful. Now, I don't have time to preach it, but here's a three-point outline on the three words, God is faithful. Number one, you see the person of God's faithfulness. Paul didn't say that men were faithful because more times than not, men at their best aren't. Paul said, God is faithful. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse six asks a very sobering question. A faithful man who can find. Uh, Men are not always faithful. Your best friend, he or she isn't always faithful. Wives aren't always faithful. Husbands aren't always faithful. But I can I tell you tonight, God sent me here to tell you, you can go on for God. You can amount to great things for God because of the person of God's faithfulness, God is faithful. The person of God's faithfulness, God. The permanence of God's faithfulness is the permanence. 
Do you know what that word is, is? That word is, is a helping verb that is always used in the present tense. Now, I'm going to say something right here. If we need to get an interpreter in a little while to explain it for you, then we'll get an interpreter. But I was raised in the foothills of North Carolina. And in North Carolina, we would say it just like this. If the Bible says God is faithful, then there'll never be a time when God ain't faithful. Do you know what that means? Let me tell you what, oh boy. Let me tell you what that means. That means when you feel saved, he's faithful. But when you get up and you don't feel saved, it doesn't mean that you're not. It doesn't mean that you're not. Because when you don't feel saved, he's still faithful. Do you know what that means? That means when the choir gets up and sing and you get Jesus measles on your arm, hey, God is faithful. But wait a minute. When they get up and sing and the preacher gets up and preaches the paint off the wall and it seems that God is a million miles away, it doesn't mean that he isn't faithful. He is. Oh, did I tell you about the permanence of God's faithfulness? We were out the other day. We left Miss Louise's and Brother Tom. We was riding around. Beautiful, beautiful Baltimore. <laughs> and the sun wasn't shining that day. And Cassie and I started talking about it. It had been a while since we'd seen the sunshine. And we was longing to see it. And I got to thinking about that. I said, Miss Cassie, the other day, when I flew into St. Louis, Missouri, from Atlanta, Georgia, it was storming and it was raining. You couldn't see the sun no matter where you look. But after a while, we got on that airplane and that pilot took us above the clouds. And did you know when you got above the clouds, the sun really was shining. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me on days when you get up and you got that spiritual spring in your step and you're ready to go, you're ready to get involved and you're ready to give so that others can hear the gospel. You know what? God is faithful. But wait just a minute. When you got more month at the end of the money and then you do money at the end of the month, when you can't put one foot in front of the other and you wonder how in the world am I going to make it just because you can't see the sun doesn't mean that the sun ain't shining. God is faithful. Can I tell you about the permanence of God's faithfulness? When you're up, he's faithful. When you're down, he's faithful. When you're in, he's faithful. When you're out, he's faithful. When you feel good, he's faithful. When you feel bad, he's, can I tell you about the faithfulness of God? God is, and if he is faithful, There'll never be a time when God ain't faithful. Y'all understand that, that we need an interpreter? Now, all of y'all have been a blessing to me this week. All of you. Thank God for all of you. But can I just say tonight, you have been used of the Lord to bless my heart this week. She's standing over there in the corner, Brother Shiflet. She's standing over there in the corner. And I wanted to go shake her hand and thank her for coming because she went to a whole lot more trouble to be faithful this week than, quite frankly, I did. She wouldn't get a paycheck for being here this week. Oh, no, she stood right there with a cane and with a body that's been over. It would have been real easy for her for the next 30 minutes to tell me how bad things are. But instead, with a stooped over body and with a trembling voice,
She said, God's so good to me. God's so good to me. Thank God for the goodness of God. You know what she's saying? There's no excuse for being a caboose because if you can stand upright, God is faithful. But when you are bent over and when you are wondering how in the world are you gonna make it through, you can still shout, you can still sing, you can still amount to great things for God because there'll never be a time when God ain't faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. God, the person, is the permanence. But then you see the persona of God's faithfulness. God is what? Faithful. And I use the word persona because it is a word, the word faithful is a word that personifies the God we serve. That's why John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14 called him the Amen. The faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. You know what you need to do tonight? If you're going to amount to anything for God, if I'm going to amount to anything for God, i got to get my eyes off of people and get my eyes on the Lord Jesus. I've never been discouraged as long as I kept my eyes on Him. I've never been defeated as long as I kept my eyes on Him. Jesus is faithful. And there is no excuse. Yeah, preacher, I'm just upset. I'm just... God has never let you down. Not one time has He ever let... By the way, who are you serving anyway? Who are you serving anyway? You know what gets me in an automobile? Listen, when I pastored, listen, I pastored the greatest church in the whole wide world. That's what I thought, and that's what your preacher thinks about this church. Every pastor ought to think that way about their church. But I'm telling you, my church loved me, and I love them. Insurance, retirement, new car every two years. You know what I was driving when God called me into missions? A Lincoln Navigator. Now I'm telling you, the Lincoln Navigator had it going on, buddy. Short as I am, I had to get a stepladder to get in it and a parachute to get out of it. But it was worth the climb. But when God called me into missions, how many of you know that know anything about missions? You don't go on deputation driving a Lincoln Navigator, buddy. You sure don't. Not if you're going to get any support. They see you driving up in that thing, man. They want you to support them. And so I told Cassie when I met with her about leaving the church, I said, we're going to have to sell our house, going to have to sell our property. And I swallowed real hard. We're going to have to get rid of that Lincoln Navigator. She said, what are we going to get? I said, hold on. Get ready. We're going with a minivan. Why a minivan? Every missionary drives a minivan. Are you kidding now, we ain't getting in the eight or nine or ten kids business, but we need all the extra room we can get, so we traded the Navigator for a minivan. What a blessing. I tell you, nobody, when I drive up now, says, Oh, boy, isn't What a gut. That is a souped-up minivan, man. Nobody. There has not been one single month. Are you listening to me? There has not been one single month that God hadn't put gas in that gas tank and there's not been one time that we needed tires that God didn't put tires on that van. In fact, the way we got the minivan, three or four churches coming together and help us with the money that we already had and supplied the need of transportation for us. So don't come up to me after the service and say, preacher, I would serve God, but I would give my life to Jesus, but I would get on board with missions around here, but can I tell you, if you drive a Lincoln Navigator, God is faithful. If you drive a minivan, God is faithful. If you have to hitchhike, God is faithful. God is faithful. There's no excuse for being a caboose because of the consistency of the Lord. And finally, only three points to the message. Lots of sub points in between, but a few, only three points to the message. Finally, 
There's no excuse for being a caboose because of the calling of the Lord. Not only the consistency of the Lord, not only the coming of the Lord, but verses 10 and beyond of the chapter teaches us about the calling of the Lord. Paul writes in verse 10, look at it with me. Now I beseech. Now that word beseech is very strong language. Paul is imploring. He's literally begging the Corinthians. I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, watch your Bible now, that ye all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. And then as you read on into the chapter, you'll discover that Paul begins to address some of the carnal issues that had arisen within the church, which in turn had caused division amongst the membership. There were those that were putting more emphasis on ministers than they were the master. There were those that we're putting more emphasis on saints than they were the sovereign. Therefore, in verses 10 and beyond, God, through the pen of the apostle Paul, begins to call them back into fellowship. He begins to call the church back into focus. These carnal Corinthians had made the same mistake that so many churches today are making. They had failed to keep the main thing the main thing. They had been distracted. They had been divided by the enemy, detoured on the road to the will of God. And therefore, in verses 10 and beyond, God, through the pen of the apostle Paul, begins calling them back into fellowship. That's why I say tonight, in closing, there's no excuse for bringing up the rear when it comes to serving the Lord and living for the Lord because of the calling of the Lord. Right. I'll close with this true story. You've listened so well. When I pastored my second church, actually, I pastored a Calvary Baptist church too. I pastored... Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. I was there seven years. I started out pastoring a little church in Jonesville, North Carolina. And I, I tell folks that I left there for sickness reasons. They were sick of me and I was sick of them. So I left the first church and to go to the Calvary Baptist Church of Statesville. I'm just kidding. Y'all come on. Wow. I understand a little more when I say things like that why God said, be not afraid of their faces. That's what he told Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces. So my first church, when I left to go to the Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina, I hung a sign on the parsonage door that said, thanks to Calvary, I don't live here anymore. So I moved to Statesville, North Carolina to pastor the Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. And boy, God began to do a great work there. We started taking on missionaries by faith and God initiated faith promise missions at our church in Statesville. I'd probably been there about three or four years and God impressed upon my heart to have a revival meeting. I called my pastor at the time. He was pastoring in Salisbury, North Carolina and I asked him, I said, would you, would you be willing to leave your church on a Sunday night? Start here on Sunday night. Let's just start the meeting on a Sunday night and go throughout the course of the week and see what the Lord does. And he consented to do that after a time of prayer. And so he came and he started preaching on a Sunday night. And during that service, I mean, for some reason, the tension, you, you could cut the tension with a knife. I mean, nobody got excited on the singing. Especially you preachers, you can understand what I'm, you've been in those services, something's just not right here. I mean, you get up and, you can't even put a sentence together without stumbling over what you're saying. And that's the way it was. And so I thought, well, that's just the first night. It, it's always a little rough the first night. It'll get better the next night. But it got worse. I mean, it got worse. It was so bad that me and the preacher got together. We had special prayer. And, 
And I said, well, let, let's just give it to tomorrow night. I mean, if we have to shut the meeting down, we can shut it down on Wednesday night if we have to. But let's just keep going and just trust the Lord that he's going to supply the need for the week. We come back that third night. We met in the prayer room, had a time of prayer. The preacher got finished preaching that night. And at the close of the service, as he extended the invitation, we had three sections of pews, just like you do here at this Calvary. And there was a young lady at that time. Her name was Joni Rogers. Joni Rogers was sitting right over here. And when the preacher extended the invitation, Joni Rogers stepped out from the pew where she was standing. And she started coming to the altar. And I thought, well, praise God, nobody had come to the altar to pray up until that time. Nobody. So I thought, well, there's Miss Joni. She's coming to pray. Maybe, maybe that'll sort of break the ice, you know. And other folks will see the need to use the altar because make much of the altar and the altar will make much of you. The altar has altered a many a life. But I thought it was interesting. Instead of coming to the altar, when Miss Joni got right here, she turned and she started walking this way. And I thought, wow, what's she doing? Where's she going? She walked all the way over here to this section of pews. And she went about right back here to where my good friend Brother Nichols was sitting. And there was a young lady whose name at that time was Christy Howard. Joni Rogers walked across the front of the church. She walked over to that side of this section of pews, and I was standing on the platform. I witnessed it myself. Joni Rogers extended her hand to Christy Howard, and she said two words to her that, quite frankly, I've heard less than 10 times in 22 years of pastoring. She said, I'm sorry. And when Joni Rogers said, I'm sorry to Christy Howard, Christy Howard threw her arms around Joni and Joni threw her arms around Christy. And they came to the altar and when they fell into the altar, I guess 10 or 12 of our young folks gathered in around them. And I was standing on the platform when this one sitting over here walked across the aisle and shook the hand of this one sitting over here. I stood on the platform that night and I witnessed husbands getting right with wives, wives getting right with husbands. And when God's people began to get right with each other, they came to the altar and they began to get right with God. Amen. Because you see, you'll never be right with God and wrong with your brother. That's exactly right. You know what God did? It was like God opened the windows of heaven. Not only did we extend that meeting for the rest of the week, we went on into the next week. And if you were to go to the Calvary Baptist Church of Statesville, North Carolina tonight, anybody that was there during that time would be able to tell you and give testimony that what was done during those 10 days of real revival could be attributed to nobody but God. And I just wonder what God could do at this Calvary Baptist Church if everybody would just get right with everybody. Because you see, let me say it one more time. You will never be right with God until you are right with your brother. Hey, it could be tonight you might need to go to someone. It could be tonight you need to say to someone in this building, I'm sorry. Can I just be very transparent with you? Now, I know all you folks, all you folks right here, especially these young folks, you're looking forward to getting married one day. I know you probably think that me and Miss Cassie has the perfect marriage, and it is a wonderful marriage. I love being married. I've been married to her now for a good while. 
But did you know, as perfect a marriage, as wonderful a marriage as we have, sometimes, sometimes, my dear friend, sometimes, brother, I have to go to Miss Cassie, and I have to say, oh, it may be hard. It may be hard. But sometimes I have to go to Miss Cassie, and I have to say two words that sometimes it's not easy to say. Sometimes I have to say, you're wrong. <laughs> no, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. I have to say, I'm sorry. And it is amazing how much better you feel when you're in fellowship one yes. with another. Yes. How in the world, why in this world would you carry around that old bitterness? Why would you carry around that unforgiveness? There's no way you can be right with your heavenly father and wrong with your brother. Maybe you just need to come back into fellowship because, you know, there is no excuse for being a caboose because of the calling of the Lord. You've listened so well. Let's bow our heads together. Oh, dear Jesus, tonight, I want to give you my best. I don't want to give you my leftovers. God, I want to give you my first fruits. God, I want to be just like that engine and I want to pull my fair share of the load. God, I want to be just like the cars in that old train and I want to carry my share of the load.